Hello, I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation. And it's my pleasure to be here today with Peter Beringer, who is one of the co-founders of DEG. DEG is sponsoring this wonderful conference here in Munich with the Gold Money Foundation. We brought Bill Murphy over from Dallas. We're going to be talking about gold, silver, um, price of uh, uh, gold, the manipulation, and just some basic educational information, you know, why gold and silver are money. You know, Peter, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today, and I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about DA, uh, DEG, how you and your, your friend co-founded it, and if you give us a little bit of history, what your aims are and how it came to be. Well, James, it's my pleasure too. It's always good to speak to you. Uh, DEG is for Deutsche Edelmetallgesellschaft, German Precious Metal Association. Um, we founded ourselves in 2006, more than five years ago. Uh, but actually, the two founders, uh, David Reimer and myself, um, had been active in the scene, the gold scene and sound money scene, uh, quite a few more years than that, uh, influenced by uh, yourself, I might add. Um, David, uh, as the initiator, had been the mo chief moderator for the Gold Satan Forum, which is the main chat room, uh, which at the time was uh, the most influential and I think the only uh, chat room in the gold box scene. Uh, hosted on the goldsatan.de um, main gold page of Germany. And I myself uh, was an author there um, and uh, already a gold bug too. And uh, in 2006, we, we two teamed up and really decided uh, it's really time to go offline too and not only discuss uh, things online. We basically uh, only convince ourselves uh, in the internet and uh, it's, at the time it was an extremely small community as you know very well. <laughs> things have changed a lot since then but um, at the time it's, it was a very small group uh, and gold was not the talk of the day nor was silver. And uh, this is when we decided to have this offline platform. Um, in our founding statements uh, we have two main objectives. Um, well, uh, inform people and educate people on gold as an investment, as a hedge against inflation. Uh, that's the individual level. Uh, you could say it's the investment uh, management level, uh, but of course we, we were and still are different uh, than the mainstream uh, uh, financial advisors at the time uh, because we really restricted ourselves to this exotic topic of gold. And uh, the other um, level we were informing and educating people uh, was the more generic level because we both were and are convinced that uh, you sh nations shouldn't have any unbacked currencies as money um, which means uh, uh, well, the do as we all know, the dollar was decoupled from gold in 1971 and uh, with the dollar, all other currencies of the world. Uh, this is the first time in world history that this, that, that this has happened. There have been paper experiments, of course, uh, before 1971. They all failed, uh, but they all failed on a regional or national basis. And um, it's they failed on a national basis uh, and this time uh, we have an, a worldwide experiment going on for 40 years and we thought it's really about time to discuss that topic uh, seriously too uh, which just did not happen uh, a lot up until in the mainstream media and uh, well an implicit target of ours is a gold backing of the currencies but this is not our uh, main objective and I think we shouldn't impose this upon any world. It's uh, currently unrealistic anyway. Um, what we should have, and this is the view of the Austrian economists, is um, uh, competition of currencies. Uh, and I believe that gold will be a serious competitor. But we would never uh, demand from anybody or from the politicians uh, to really, um, with their uh, legal power, uh, constitutional power, back um, gold um, as the only monopoly currency. Uh, what we need is competition and uh, there's room for paper money too. I think uh, maybe we can go into that a little bit deeper. Okay, so the, the, basically the, the mission of uh, DEG is to provide educational material about money and, and currency. Uh, let them pick and choose which is the money or currency that they basically feel best for their own particular circumstances not necessarily to force any political change, but very, very free market oriented. Um, let currencies compete on their, on their own strengths and weaknesses. Yes, absolutely. As I said, we, uh, there's no point in enforcing it um, legally. Gold has never needed a monopoly legalized backing from, 
from whatever um, authority there is out there. It has been natural money for in many different cultures throughout times and history. Uh, even independently in various um, cultures, gold and silver have become money. And usually the main money of choice that people choose freely. And this is true even though in the 19th, since the 19th century, or actually since the Roman times or even earlier, um, the sovereigns, the monarchs at the time, had their uh, faces um, coined on, the, on their coins, but it was never really necessary. Um, and it's really a development of the 20th century, uh, talk about 1913 when uh, the Fed uh, was founded and institutionalized and when paper money became into existence and got monopolized at the time in the US and uh, then 1971 when the same happened all over the world. We live in that experiment and uh, well, there's no point in uh, backing gold <laughs> with uh, legal laws. Uh, we all need a free and fair competition which we currently do not have. We have legal tender laws and even though we don't have it explicitly in our founding statements, uh, implicitly I, uh, we demand uh, basically legal tender laws to be abolished. Mm. I'm the first one to admit, and I'm Goldbach, you know, um, that there is, is not and will never be an objective value of an ounce of gold, nor silver. Uh, with silver, it's a little bit different because it has uh, industrial a good use. industrial use too. But um, sticking to gold, there is no objective value for it. it, it it's, it's psychology to some extent. It's even uh, metaphoric uh, to some extent because uh, it has been around for so long that people just um, are transcendental uh, to some extent. People just believe in it. But there is a root cause in that and there's a reason why it has become this. And the reason I think, and I'm a rational analyst here, is, um, is physical, strictly physical. If you look, look at the periodic table of elements, um, and at those, I think, 160 elements. And even if you add artwork, as you mentioned, or um, real estate or land, which all could work theoretically as money, uh, you could basically rule out or scratch out from the periodic table of elements each and every one of these with, a very, with very few exceptions. And the exceptions are the precious metals, uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and maybe rhodium to some extent. And why, why can you uh, scratch them, uh, these, uh, the, all the others out? Because some of them are liquid. So you shouldn't have liquid as a, as a currency or liquids. Some of them are gases, so you would never use helium as a, um, as a currency or money. Uh, some of them are just not scarce. Um, so maybe uh, it, if you need a ton of lead to pay for something, that's just not practicable. Mm. Some of them um, are maybe too rare. It's not gold, I am really stressing this point, uh, but there are elements that are just too rare. You could not probably not coin a thousand coins uh, uh, worldwide uh, with some very rare elements. Um, so that's not feasible too. Some of them are toxic and some of them are even radioactive and you don't want to kill yourself with your money. So uh, this is um, not something uh, feasible. And you can really go on and on, scratch everything out. It comes down to gold, silver, platinum and palladium. Um, and artwork is not feasible too. Uh, you cannot really divide it. Um, some uh, elements or other possible means of money uh, are too heavy. Uh, they are specific, uh, no, they are not heavy enough. Uh, their specific weight is just too low. And if you really have a two, uh, an ounce coin of gold and weigh it against a copper nickel coin the same size, you can feel and uh, see the difference. Uh, so th th there are very plain physical reasons uh, why initially gold and silver have become the natural money uh, for all those reasons, because there's not a lot of uh, else left. Having said that, it's of course true that uh, there have been uh, other forms of money and they were cho chosen freely by uh, many people and cultures all over the world throughout history because maybe gold was not available or it was not available to everybody. Uh, so silver became the two poor man's money over time and uh, copper has been used. Uh, and of course you can do bartering uh, with real estate versus commodities or with uh, services uh, versus um, silver. Um, uh, or, or something else. So bartering is of course uh, uh, an option to do business and has been throughout history. Uh, but the, the world, the, the world ha had to invent money at a certain point in time because bartering is, uh, is just, uh, it works against the um, 
uh, well, the labor sharing, uh, which is so value creating. And if you don't have money and have to barter and have to do everything on your own, um, well, it, it's just not value creating. Money is really central to society. In other words, we need money to cooperate with each other as we go into the marketplace to fulfill our needs or wants. You know, we have a, a, this voluntary mechanism where you have a good to sell that I want to purchase. We need some kind of means for transacting. So the point that you made that even if gold wasn't available, like the Pacific Islands, uh, they came up with something that was available to enable people to communicate, oh, yeah. to perform economic calculation. Um, and, but. Let me just ask you this. Do you agree with me that gold is the best form of money basically because it really doesn't have any other usefulness uh, in industry or if it is used in industry, it's so inconsequential relative to this above ground stock of gold that exists, you know, basically which is all of the gold mined throughout history. Gold does not disappear. Yes, I, I do agree with that, um, even though from a strictly investment perspective it's uh, not so good if a good doesn't disappear because it, uh, it takes longer to, for it to become scarce, but that's a, that's a different story. Yes, I, I do agree with that and uh, it's the natural... It's, it's uh, scarce relative to the huge amount of paper that's been created. I think we'll be getting to that <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the value goes up um, uh, proportionally to the money that is being created, which is all that money uh, since, well, let's say 1913, uh, you could also say 1971 uh, and uh, you can only destroy um, paper money and paper assets uh, if you destroy the debt behind it which is not very likely these days uh, so I, I think the value the, you could in a relative terms you could calculate uh, or give a formula for the real value of money of gold uh, if you say an ounce of gold is a dollar divided by N, and N is the trust uh, people still have in the paper money system. And as we all know, that uh, trust uh, decreases uh, with every uh, dollar or every billion, or should I say trillions of dollars, uh, uh, the monetary aggregates increase. And if they increase um, uh, to infinity, then the uh, denominator in this uh, formula goes to zero because then the trust uh, people attach to uh, the monetary authorities and to the politicians goes to zero. And if you divide one uh, by zero, well, the, the value of gold can go to infinity. And this is um, why it's uh, value protecting. That's uh, what happened in Zimbabwe as an example when the currency hyperinflated. It, nobody was willing to change the currency, the Zimbabwe dollar for gold. It also happened here in uh, Germany uh, oh, during yeah. the Weimar Republic when the Reichsmark collapsed. Nobody was willing to exchange the Reichsmark at the end of at the end of the period for an ounce of gold. Um, it could happen to the dollar, do you think? History tells us it can happen everywhere, um, and it has happened everywhere. The only problem in, um, is that uh, there are not many people around who still um, remember the Western world, especially not the American world, um, that uh, the dollar can go bust because for very different and uh, complex reasons it never did since 1776. Uh, it's probably the only exception of a currency um, worldwide uh, which never collapsed, the paper currency I should add. Uh, of course, uh, the well, dollar it was of tied course, to gold. Of course the dollar was tied to gold up until and 1913 silver. and silver and uh, after 1913-14 it still was uh, tied to gold indirectly in the Bretton Woods arrangements yeah. up until 1971. So we're really talking about 40 years only and this is true not only for the dollar but for everything. We are um, in the same situation more or less uh, with all Western countries. Of course you can look to Zimbabwe, but uh, the mainstream always has an excuse not to compare Zimbabwe to the US. Uh, but Germany in 1920 was one of the world's great powers, was one of the most advanced countries on the face of the earth, had one of the highest standards of living uh, at that time among all countries of the world, yet its currency collapsed. If it can happen to Germany in the 1920s, why can't it happen to America today? As I said, it, it can happen everywhere, but I think if you really do want to do that comparison, there are differences um, because, I mean, the German situation in 1923, when basically the hyperinflation happened, uh, was pretty diff different. Uh, well, uh, at, at, 
at first view, at first glance, uh, it was different because Germany, of course, had lost the First World War. There was the contract of Versailles, which um, imposed really harsh conditions on, on Germany. And uh, the only way, basically, to, to pay these back, we're talking about, I think, uh, if you recalculate the, the um, uh, demands, the um, uh, allies imposed on German after World War One. Uh, it comes down to some 60 to 90,000 tons of gold, um, which was more or less uh, the, um, at the time, all gold that was ever mined throughout history. It's so it was impossible that. to pay this back, uh, yeah. not with gold, of course, which Germany did not have in 1918 anyway, uh, but um, it would have been almost impossible to pay it back in decades. So th this is, this is uh, the German situation at the time. Uh, today in, in, in the US, of course, you haven't lost a war. Basically, the U.S. has won almost every war throughout history since its um, own, uh, well, citizen war between the North and the South, south in the 1900s. Um, oh, sorry, in the 1860s. 18, yeah. And, um, and uh, well, on the one hand, you have never lost the war. On the other hand, the U.S. lives above, above its mean, and you can calculate that pretty easy, easily by approximately $5 billion per day. This is uh, the uh, non-backed, uh, um, let's do the calculation. Uh, the U.S. Uh, these days has uh, a new, uh, will go into debt in 2011 uh, by pro at least $1.8 trillion, trillion. Um, dollars this year, and this is the official number. Mm -hmm. in, in one of my blogs at godsightenblog.com, uh, I had already predicted that number a year ago when the official number was still, I think, 1.4 trillion, which <laughs> that's quite some difference. And I, I believe we will end uh, probably in 2011 close to 2 trillion, uh, which is more than double than was admitted a year ago. And uh, just to go, let me just interrupt for a sec because I want to go back to the, the parallels to. Uh, the, Weimar Republic yeah, to... I'm coming to, to that. <laughs> yeah, because the debt was imposed on Germany. The debt in the U.S. is self-imposed, but the external debts were yeah. there in both countries. So isn't that the similarity? If, if you put it like this, and I would have come to that, uh, yes, I, I would agree. Um, there is the similarity. Uh, the, infra the U.S. infrastructure is not um, well destroyed, but uh, admittedly the German infrastructure had not, was not really destroyed after World War I because the, the war never came to Germany's borders. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, yes, you can compare that. And uh, well, five, five billion dollars a day, uh, and uh, the uh, only half, not even half of uh, those 1.8 trillion dollars per year, which I just mentioned, are backed by, um, well, tax income. So you could really say, and I'm, I'm serious here, that the U.S. lives about 100 percent above their means, uh, well, were they forced to, uh, to pay for their standard of living, and especially for their national state expenses um, by taxes only, they would have to, well, to save uh, 1.5 trillion dollars somewhere. So just like... No, one, one trillion, sorry. Yeah. So just like the Reichsbank in the early 1920s kept printing um, Reichsmark currency uh, because the debt was never, could never be repaid, the U.S. is in a similar situation. The debt can never be repaid. I think the Federal Reserve probably recognizes that and they're doing the same thing uh, that the Reichsbank did. And I've actually written a number of times oh, yeah. about uh, the similarities between Mr. Bernanke and um, uh, Rudolf Havenstein, who was the governor of the Reichsbank at the time. They both were following conventional wisdom. Uh, they both were printing currency because they were afraid to uh, stop printing because of the implications of what it might do to the economy. Um, using this as an example, is the dollar going to go the same way as the Reichsmark? The <clears throat> The hyperinflation story um, had a, well, I would say, you could say it had, has had a 10-year prelude uh, before 1923, but uh, basically uh, the, the story started in 1918 after the lost war, and then came Versailles, and it took, uh, and in, already in 1920 or 1921, you could feel the first, uh, you could see the first signs of inflation. Uh, and this is really comparable, I think, to today's situation. Uh, if we had no uh, statistical, well, uh, easing um, and, uh, well, for statistical fog over the real inflation numbers, um, then we would probably be already at uh, 6 or 8 percent, maybe even higher, depending on what market you look at. Um, uh, per year nowadays. And this is more or less the situation in Germany in 1920, 21 maybe. 
uh, and relentlessly uh, the numbers went up uh, and they really uh, went exponentially, even parabolic, as of summer of 1923. That's about how long it took. Uh, and it was unsustainable. Everybody could see it. it was, uh, no, nobody could uh, deny it, uh, I would say, as of the end of 1922. And people reacted. They uh, disposed of their earnings and their salaries as quickly as possible. At the very end, uh, they, they spent it. The, the workers in the factories got paid, I think, daily. Maybe at the very end, they got paid twice daily. And their wives, they waited at the factory doors and uh, spent the money as quickly as possible. And uh, of course, this is not sustainable. Everybody knew. I think in 1922, uh, maybe early 23, and it, uh, after another six months in mid-November of 1923, uh, it was over. It was unsustainable. Uh, it's a story in itself how the hyperinflation was ended then. Uh, it was more or less a psychological trick, but uh, by November 2003, people uh, were, uh, um, were ready to accept everything as money uh, if it had at least the promise of some backing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not gold at the time, but uh, some other trick the, the government um, pulled out. Mm -hmm. So I want to get your views on what's mm -hmm. happening here with silver. Um, have you been writing about silver on your blog at goldzeiten.de? Uh, -E. Oh yes, several times, of course. Uh, initially, I didn't even have my own blog when I, uh, I think I first written about silver um, seriously and in earnest uh, back in 2006 when the SLV was founded. Um, I don't want to go into the specifics there, but... Uh, the SLV, the ETF. Uh, SLV, the it was the Barclays Silver yeah. ETF. It was the first ETF yeah. uh, at the time. Um, it's still around, but it's uh, owned by another entity now. And it, it has become, as I had predicted, uh, the largest uh, holder of investment silver at the time. And uh, back in 2006, one should not forget, uh, there had not been any investment use for silver at all. Um, if you take uh, jewelry aside, um, on a net basis, uh, we almost 100% uh, uh, of the newly minted silver was used um, industrially. And it only, um, well, this SLV was at the same time promising and dangerous uh, when it uh, opened uh, doors in 2006 because uh, obviously it was now an easy method to, over the stock exchange, acquire silver. And the promise was it's physical silver. And uh, at the other hand, uh, well, it was um, a centralized um, pool of silver. And it's always, it's always a little bit easier to manipulate with uh, centralized pools, but I'm not saying uh, it was unserious. I think the, uh, it was way easier to manipulate the silver price down or, uh, or to have a what I call fractional silver um, system. But it's no longer 100% industrial usage as it was four years ago. That's when I initially wrote about it. Um, and I was always skeptic when it came to those unallocated silver pools. Uh, there, are, there are also other. Um, means uh, how the or tech, well techniques I should say how the silver price is being um, suppressed and kept down. We all know that uh, the comex trading is more than suspicious. Uh, we also know that um, uh, the afternoon trading uh, between the a London AM and uh, PM fixings are um, well. The trading patterns have been pretty. Um, well, suspicious too. Adrian Douglas from Gata um, Associate has done so quite some research into that. Yeah, uh, he's done I, some I, I've, I've co-authored um, uh, an article in a renowned very German um, publication on that one too. And uh, it was really interesting to see that uh, whenever Gata and other um, well, important figures uh, that really had some um, public uh, that uh, that listened uh, came up with some credible information about how the gold or silver prices were suppressed. And uh, well, Bill Murphy was initially successful, I think, in uh, in 2001 already, um, and uh, then with this conference in 2005, and uh, of course with this testimony, uh, 2010, uh, the CFTC testimony. Uh, so, uh, whenever they came up with new information that was credible, the market actually reacted. It t sometimes it took a little bit a while, but uh, the idea that the gold and silver prices um, are manipulated or suppressed 
is no longer a conspiracy theory. And this is really some new development. It has taken a long time uh, until serious uh, circles believe in that. And whenever uh, a cabal or a manipulation uh, comes out in the open and a lot of people believe in that, um, it's more or less over. You cannot continue it. Uh, having said that, I accept that the Cabell has changed their methods throughout the last 10 or 15 years several times, so uh, you can never be sure what, the, what next they have on their agenda. Um, but currently, especially since September of 2010, uh, if you just look at the price movements, especially for silver, um, uh, this is a historic situation, but uh, the history was not... Uh, this is just a logical development. Currently, the ups, upswing, uh, the history, uh, basically, or the... The historic distortion of the market uh, has lasted for more than 10, maybe even 15 years. And I think in our event tonight, we will uh, hear quite something about that in, de in detail. I'm looking forward to that very much. Um, it's been my pleasure to be here with uh, Peter Beringer, the co-founder of DEG. You can read his blogs on Germany's most popular website for gold uh, information, goldzeiten.de. Peter, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, James.